In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, very glad that you could join us today for Open Line Monday here on EWTN Radio. I'm Tom Price filling in for uh, Jack Williams. He will be back very soon. But as you know, Monday is the day that we uh, tackle apologetics and we bring on our, our very own Father John Tregilio. How are you feeling today, Father? Oh, uh, a lot better. I, In fact, after this show, I have to go get the uh, EKG done, but it's just oh, a regular no. annual uh uh, enterprise. <laughs> you were uh, under the weather last week. We couldn't get you on live. Are you feeling uh, better than last week? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had some kind of reaction to something. Uh, oh. It was either medicine or uh, something I ate. Well, we're very glad that you're back with us, and we are here live for you on this Monday afternoon on EWTN's Open Line Monday. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Father John, um, particularly those kind of questions we we like to tackle uh, regarding apologetics, uh, how can you better defend your faith? 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us outside of North America, Please dial the U.S. country code and then 205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for our response and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. If you'd like, you can certainly send us an email, openline at EWTN.com, the address, openline at EWTN.com. Be sure you put Father John on the subject line, or you could put apologetics, or you could put Monday. Any of those will help us uh, get the right emails to the right person. So, Father, we have a question here from Mark in Pennsylvania who says, Father, we have a high schooler in our parish who is currently discerning his vocation with regard to choosing a seminary. Could you please tell us the difference between a seminary affiliated with a diocese and a more independent seminary? Also, please discuss the criteria that a potential seminarian should use when evaluating different seminaries. Thank you and God's blessing to all during this Advent season. And that's again from Mark in Pennsylvania. Well, that's a very good question. And uh, first and foremost, you always want to make sure that the seminary that the young man is going to go to, or he could even be middle-aged or even older. We have some fellows here in the seminary, one or two that are actually older than me. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe, but just by a couple of years. <laughs> okay. But uh, majority are, are are a lot younger, and uh, orthodoxy of doctrine is certainly paramount. But also that there's a solid spiritual program that the men have time, uh-huh. and also they get the formation. Uh, there's four we call dimensions of uh, seminary formation. This goes back to uh, Saint John Paul the Great when he wrote Pastoris Double Vobis, and then when the uh, Ratio Fundamentalis was uh, revised. Uh, this is the sort of the blueprint for how seminaries are to run. Uh, the four dimensions are there's the human dimension, you have the theological, uh, intellectual dimension, you've got sp- uh, spiritual, and then you have pastoral. And all four of those are absolutely essential. You can't have one doing exceptionally well and then the others mediocre. You need to have all four uh, very solid, which we obviously have here at Mount St. Mary's in, in uh, Emmitsburg, Maryland. Yes, yes. But also, uh, you know, St. Charles Borromeo in Philadelphia, uh, St. Joseph's Dunwoody, a lot of very good seminaries. I would have to say that uh, the bad ones that were around when I was uh, in minor seminary, I went to high school seminary and college seminary uh, and uh, major seminary, 12 years altogether um, that I was in the seminary. Back in the 70s and 80s, uh, there were a lot of uh, bad ones. And Fortunately, by God's grace, uh, a lot of the bad ones are gone. They're closed, uh, shut up, um, yeah. moved, or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's one good thing to, to depend upon. But also, if you're going to be studying for a good diocese, like uh, we have uh, in, in Harrisburg, they're going to send you to a, a good place. But you want to make sure that those four dimensions that I mentioned, the human, the intellectual, the spiritual, and the pastoral, are all uh, up to snuff. 
and uh, certainly a reputation is good. Um, if you know priests who went there to find out uh, what their experience was. Uh, and most dioceses may ask you if you have a preference, but um, my experience has been you get sent, the bishop tells you yeah. uh, where you're going to go. So um, making sure that you're you know, uh, in a good diocese with a good bishop, uh, he's going to send to uh, a good seminary. Mark, thanks so much uh, for your email. Here is a question now from Carlos in Texas. I heard Father Tregilio comment that the Church never taught that we must be card-carrying members of the Catholic Church to be saved. However, I was listening to an SSPX priest, that would be the <laughs> Pius X priest, explain that was in fact what the Church taught. How can a lay person determine what is true and what is indeed a poor interpretation? Father? Well, read the Catechism of the Catholic Church that was uh, promulgated under St. John Paul II. Uh, in the Catechism, it makes it very clear. And also, this is reaffirmed in the uh, Compendium and in the Companion to the Catechism. And even St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, re refers to uh, this idea of uh, a, a baptism of desire, because uh, the first and foremost is the baptism of water, which is the sacrament of baptism, the baptism of blood, which one is martyred for the faith, but also the, the baptism of desire, where someone wants to be or would have wanted to be baptized. Uh, St. Augustine talks about the universal salvific will of God, that God gives everyone sufficient grace to be saved, but it becomes efficacious only for those who accept and cooperate with it. Uh, but the Church, uh, Dominus Jesus, an excellent document in recent times, which certainly reiterates the Church's teaching, uh, extra clays and nulla salus, outside the Church there's no salvation. But what defines membership in the Church? Full membership is when you're baptized and you make a profession of faith, you're receiving all the sacraments, but there's also um, in, uh, where I would say partial or imperfect communion membership where people do are not aware. The only time someone's going to be really in big trouble where they're going to say their salvation is in jeopardy is if they're in a state of mortal sin or uh, they know, they know cognitively, intellectually, that Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church and they intentionally, deliberately, and freely reject that. If it's through no fault of their own, we call invincible ignorance, then they're not going to be penalized for what they don't know. Church has always taught that. So when uh, Father Feeney got on the radio in the 30s and said, if you're not a card-carrying Catholic, you're going to go to hell, uh, Rome excommunicated him. Yeah, and uh, yeah. he repented. But uh, so the uh, SSPX uh, priest who said that w was not accurate. Okay, that clears that up. Thank you so much uh, for your email, Carlos. Appreciate hearing that. Now, here's a fascinating one here, uh, Father. This is from Clara. Why does the Catholic Church take up dogmatic issues that really cannot be answered here on Earth? <laughs> well, because people ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the Church only defines those doctrines which she believes that uh, are necessary for our salvation. And Jesus is the one who founded the Church. Jesus is the one who established the authority of the magisterium. And so the Pope and the bishops in union with him have that authority. And so when, say, for instance, when Pope Pius XII uh, defined the, the, the dogma of the Assumption in 1950, uh -huh. um, that was necessary for us to know. And uh, if there's questions that we don't need for salvation, then they're not going to be not going to be promulgated. Uh, those things that we need to know are taught, and the deposit of faith. Actually, you know, we believe Revelation ended with uh, John the Evangelist, the uh, the apostle. But the Church's uh, teaching, uh, there's no new doctrines or dogmas, but there's those dogmas which have to be uh, refined uh, or explained in a way that that uh, contemporary uh, culture civilization can fully appreciate. Okay. And we're going to go out on this uh, question here. This is actually from uh, Bill. Why should I believe what the Bible says? How do we know that the Gospels are accurate? Well, there's a, there's a good document that uh, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith and the Pontifical Biblical Commission put out, Historicity of the Gospels. And that's church teaching, magisterial teaching. Mm -hmm. It's in the Catechism that we firmly believe that everything that's in the Gospels accurately tell us what historically Jesus said and did. Okay. 
Well, there that is. And uh, one more quick one here from Johnny. How long after a loved one has died are we considered to be able to ask them for their intercession? Immediately. Immediately. Uh, All right. Immediately. The only time that that would not work is if, God forbid, uh, they ended up in hell. But since we don't know uh, if someone ended up there, we can hope for the best. And if so if they're in purgatory or if they're in heaven, they can obviously, and we certainly believe that they can intercede for us to Jesus, the one mediator. Uh, so as soon as they die, they end up in one of those three places. Sounds good to me. If you have a question for Father John Tregilio, our phone lines are open right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Open line uh, Monday with Father John Tregilio right here on EWTN. No prayer is useless. All prayer has power. If you say the rosary, it's real prayer because it's a mini scripture. If you say a novena prayer, it's a real prayer. It's just somebody there to help you when your mind is blank, to give glory and praise to God, to be humble and ask for whatever it is you want. All prayer is pleasing to God if it's done with a grateful, loving heart. And now, the EWTN Family Prayer with Father Joseph. Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me, our EWTN family prayer. Today we pray for atheists and agnostics. O Holy Spirit, Spirit of Truth, we worship you. We pray for those who either do not believe or who believe wrongly. Enlighten their minds with your light and inflame their hearts with your love. Give the gift of the faith to atheists and agnostics. Humble their pride and inspire their souls with your grace. Burst through their blindness with your radiance and use EWTN as an instrument of salvation for many. Amen. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Hey, we're glad you're joining us for Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN Radio. Our phone number 833 833- 288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Hey, don't miss the latest political and cultural reporting and analysis on topics of interest to Catholics and people of all kinds of faith on The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. And right now you can get news from The World Over into your email inbox every week. Sign up today by visiting EWTN.com. Click on the word subscribe. And if you're ready, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We begin today with Steve. Steve's in Shelbyville, Kentucky, listening on Facebook. Hey, Steve, what's on your mind today, sir? Hey, Tom. Hey, Father. Uh, I just got a question about the Mass. Uh, Our priest, we got a new priest in town, and he does something. I've never seen it anywhere else. We, at the time when we all say the Our Father right before the consecration, he calls all the children up around the altar and says the Our Father. It's, I find it very distracting. Uh, what's the, uh, what would you say about that? Okay. Uh, I would say I wouldn't, not only would I not do it, I would say it shouldn't be done. Uh, the rubrics of the Mass, which is contained in the general instruction of the Roman Missal, the, otherwise abbreviated as the G-I-R-M, or as we say, the seminary, the germ, uh, that tells us where people's postures and location are supposed to be. So the only people that really should be in the sanctuary are those actually uh, involved with the uh, physical celebration of the, of the Mass. So the priest, the deacon, the servers, uh, anyone who's going to be, say, re- reading from the lectionary. Uh-huh. Um, but inviting the kids into the sanctuary, especially uh, during the Our Father, I think what it does is it um, it puts the wrong emphasis because 
the most important part of the mass is obviously the consecration, and uh, certainly it's good that the kids are not in the sanctuary for that. But to accentuate that part of the mass by inviting them in, they can obviously pray the Our Father from their pews with their parents, mm -hmm. which I think is a better um, symbol that yeah. they're praying with their families than making them separate from from there. So it, it's it's an abuse that. Uh, I think you know you need to speak to the priest and ask him why he's doing it, and if you don't get a satisfactory uh, explanation, then you need to ask the diocese. Okay, Steve, is that helpful for you? Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, I've I've tried to talk to him about a couple things. He just laughs me off, and mm. he's a nice guy and everything. But I mean, I I find a lot of things he does very. I, you know, I'm a convert from the Protestant faith, and I sometimes I feel like I'm leaving the Baptist Church in Montclair, California, where I grew up. <laughs> so uh, it, it's yeah it's very it's it's disheartening but i mean you know i, I know i'm you know i just it's hard because you don't want to you know i don't want to feel like oh. the mass police but sure <laughs> sure yeah, there's 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 stuff that that does it i, I cringe yeah and i i knew that i i knew the answer but i wanted to get it from a pro <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you called and certainly when you call the diocese you don't have to be judgmental uh always with charity but you say you know, as whoever you called the, the office, diocesan office of worship and liturgy, say, you know, could you explain to me what the the official policy is of the diocese? Because um, I would like to know, and yeah. that way you're not necessarily throwing them under the bus. But you have a right as a Catholic Christian to have the sacrament celebrated properly as well as validly. There you go, Steve. Thanks so much for your call. That opens up a line for you right now at eight three three two eight eight EWTN. That's eight three three. 288-3986. Open line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN Radio. Let's go to Tacoma, Washington now and talk with Tim listening on the great Sacred Heart Radio. Hey, Tim, what's on your mind today? Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, my family, we homeschool our children. We have three children. We're homeschooling in a, in a classical uh, uh, Christian uh, method. Uh -huh. And um, my, my oldest one, my 15-year-old daughter now, we're we're preparing for a debate. We're doing debating and working on the topic of the death penalty. And just wondering if uh, you could point me in some directions, maybe from the church or the church fathers and what some folks had to say on this topic and we could use for debate would be great. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know of any of the fathers uh, offhand who had any particular comment about the death penalty or capital oh. punishment. I think there is something in, in, in the Summa Theologica from St. Thomas Aquinas, but it, is, it was always presumed that this was the state and not just like a, a state like in the United States, but you know the civil government, the secular government always had the right to use the death penalty, but not an absolute right. And certainly we see that now in the catechism that was issued under Pope John Paul, then it, he himself tweaked it. Uh, Pope Benedict uh, added a tweak, and then <laughs> Pope Francis just tweaked himself. And they both, all three of them, concurred that under the present situation and circumstances, it doesn't seem uh, necessary that uh, recourse to the death penalty is, is needed. But that doesn't mean that intrinsically the state doesn't have that right. Uh, it's just something that has to be done uh, with the proper care and diligence and only as a last resort. And since there are alternatives, that's where the recent Holy Fathers have said that, you know, they don't feel that uh, it it is needed any longer. But that being said, because it was used in the past and could probably be used again in the future, mm -hmm. particularly if you're going to talk about, you know, like terrorists, like what would happen with 9-11 and, and things like that, um, that is a last resort. And I think wherever, even if you were to talk to one of the fathers of the church, even someone like St. Augustine would, would also concur. Um, that's something you want to be always, always, always very careful and make sure this is done justly and equitably. And the problem is, as we see here in the art country, it depends on what state you live in. It depends on uh, how much uh, you can afford an attorney. If you're a public person uh, of notoriety, you're going to get a good attorney. And if you're a poor person, you know, you, if you, you're you going to depend on the public defender unless somebody volunteers pro bono. Yeah. And uh, there's not a lot of consistency as there was before. But in the past, some of the, the instruments of death were extre extremely uh, cruel and inhumane. And today, the problem is that, yeah, they may be uh, a lot less painless, but then it makes it a lot easier to do it. So uh, 
I don't don't think you're going to find anybody in in the church fathers per se who were against uh, the death penalty, but I, I think all of them would have added something about uh, how it's to be done as a last resort and only you know uh, in extreme cases. Tim, great question. Thanks so much for it. It is uh, Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. We have a line open for you right now, one line actually, at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Michael is driving through Texas listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hello, Michael. What's on your mind today? Well, uh, Father, I was uh, at my dad's funeral uh, last week. And I had a chance to meet a cousin who had uh, fallen away from the church because uh, evidently his dad abused him severely, which we never knew about. But anyways, he was saying that the Pope is torturing people underneath the Vatican. And I'm just wondering if you ever heard of any uh, rumors like that. Okay. Uh, was the question that the Pope was torturing people? Under yes. the Vatican? Yes. Um, I know there's all kinds of bizarre um, folklore and urban legends. I mean, when I was in the seminary, you know, the, the one that was going around back then was that uh, non Catholics really f- believed that uh, between the rectory and the convent were a graveyard of where the babies were born uh, because the priests sort of uh, somehow snuck out in the middle of the night, impregnated the nuns, and then when uh. they had their babies. I mean, that was common at, at our time that people said it, but how many people actually believed it? Uh, but the, the thing is, you know, what's underneath St. Va- uh, Peter's at the Vatican are the bones of the martyrs. Yeah, you know, St. Yeah. Peter buried there. You've got the martyrs, the necropolis, uh, you know, the whole sort of city of the dead down there. These are martyrs who died. Uh, no, no torture ever took place uh, uh, on the Vatican property. Even during the Inquisition, uh, you know, the, the only people who imposed those kind of methods were the secular government. Uh, the religious aspect of the Inquisition was to determine the facts of the matter, and any type of punishment was then relegated to the, the civil authorities. So, uh, you know, there are no tortured instruments that were used, that are used, and like I said, are you going to find in the, in the basement of the Vatican is St. Peter and his friends? <laughs> That's right. Appreciate your call there, Michael. It is uh, Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN Radio. Let's go to uh, Janine now. Janine is in Columbia, Missouri. And uh, let's see here. looks like she's listening on Covenant Radio. Janine, what's on your mind today? Yes, I was wondering, how does a person work their way out of purgatory? Okay. Okay, well, one, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pelagianism uh, was the... Um, the heresy that St. Augustine vigorously uh, fought against, where one could earn their way to heaven, or in this case, earn your way out of purgatory. Um, what you can do is you can't help yourself once you're in purgatory, but your loved ones here on earth can help you. We just don't know particularly how, but certainly praying for the dead, which goes back to the book of Maccabees in the Old Testament, uh, that we firmly believe that in some way, praying for the dead Uh, Having masses said for the dead is an excellent way, which unfortunately a lot of people are almost no longer doing or very sparingly doing. And I, as a priest, love offering mass, but in a particular way, offering mass for a deceased uh, uh, person, because I know that that's the best prayer that can be offered for them. You can also offer up uh, an indulgence uh, for uh, the souls in purgatory, and you can make uh, sort of mortifications for them. But in terms of getting time off their sentence, that's something the Church never uh, formally uh, endorsed. But I know some people, again, in the, in the popular parlance, sort of I had this idea that, well, can we shave some time off a of grandma's sentence? <laughs> so, you know, let's get like three years off. It, it never worked that way. The, the, the years and the, the, the days of, uh, of a partial indulgence were not time in purgatory. It was the equivalent of, you know, what graces you would have got if you did that amount of time of doing corporal works of mercy. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeanine, uh, for, your, for your call on that, uh, that subject. Father, do you think that's m- often misunderstood? Because if you go into an old prayer book where it'll say 300 days, yeah. and, and it's like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, when I was a, in, a kid in grade school, I thought, oh, I'll help Grandma <laughs> get some 300 days off her sentence. And, and, and fortunately, people believed that, but it was not church teaching, 
And certainly at the time of Martin Luther, during the Reformation, there were some unscrupulous clergy Hmm. who played on people's ignorance and said, oh, you can get your loved ones out a little early uh, if you made a donation to whatever. And uh, that's simony, you know, if you're trying to buy spiritual favors, either for yourself or someone else. But uh, any corporal work of mercy, and certainly, you know, uh, donating money to the poor or to the church so so she can help the poor, uh, there's a possibility of of graces being made available, but it's not a a, a quid pro quo. All right. Janine, thanks again for your call. In a moment, we're going to be talking with Marie in Abilene, Texas. We'll go from Marie to Maria in Palm Beach County, Florida. And uh, Chris is in upstate New York. We have a line open for you right now as well. 833-288-EWTN for Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN. This is EWTN Catholic Radio. Archbishop Cordelione talks about the National Catholic Register. The Register's content is so critically important in the society we're living in now. There's an absence of the practice of religion in public life. So all the more important is it for people to be reading the Register so that they can acquire more understanding of our Catholic faith. I've appreciated the catechetical benefits of the content of the Register. It presents very clear Catholic teaching in a way that is easily digestible. To get six free issues, order online at ncregister.com forward slash radio or call 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. That's ncregister.com forward slash radio or 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. Call or click today. The National Catholic Register. Read faithfully. Want to be notified when EWTN Open Line goes live on Facebook? Follow EWTN Radio's Facebook page and click the bell icon to be notified. Smart speakers help with a lot these days. Did you know you can use your smart speaker to hear the top stories of the day from a Catholic perspective? If you have an Alexa, just say, Alexa, open Catholic News. Welcome back to the latest news from Catholic News Agency. For more information on how to get the latest Catholic news on your smart speaker or wherever you get your podcasts, go to catholicnewsagency.com slash smart speakers. Hi, this is Janet Williams. Please join us for Women of Grace tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern here on EWTN Radio. And now back to Open Line with Father John Tregilio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Phones are a little bit on the heavy side on Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio, but you know what the uh, Holy Father John Paul the Great said? Be not afraid. There is a line open (laughs) for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. My recommendation is call now so that we can hopefully get you on the air on today's program. Here now is Maria. Maria is listening in Palm Beach County, Florida. Hey there, Maria. What's on your mind today? Hi, good afternoon. Um, My mother passed away um, two months ago. Uh, from nine years of dementia, mm. and and I was just wondering. We were talking with my husband and said, "I hope she's not in purgatory," because I felt like she lived in purgatory for nine years. I was just wanted to say, to wait, what you think about it?" Any <laughs> thoughts there, Father? Yeah, certainly. I, I'm I'm very sorry for her loss and uh, assure her of my prayers. And I do believe that a lot of people do their purgatory here on earth. And remember, purgatory is not a, a prison uh, where you're being sent away. Uh, purgatory is a state of cleansing. And uh, if there, the pain of purgatory is not like the pain of hell, where it's punishment for your bad deeds. The pain of purgatory is the cleansing. It's like when you have to wash your hands really, really well. 
it's not going to be comfortable, but you know it's it, it's necessary, mm -hmm. and the end result is a lot better. Almost like when you're got to polish uh, silverware that's been tarnished, you got to put a lot of uh, elbow grease into it, and then it, it, it sparkles. But uh, I had a brother who had muscular dystrophy. Uh, my dad had leukemia. My mother had a whole variety of of medical issues before she died, and I really believe that a lot of people. Uh, do their purgatory and maybe even some purgatory for others oh. so that uh, it is certainly possible. Church has always taught that there is the, the, the possibility of some people going directly to heaven or just a short uh, amount of purgatory. Uh, but if they are in purgatory, don't see it as, as like a, a hell with a parole. Uh, see it as something that's medicinal, but also have prayers said for them. I mean, have masses said for them, pray for them that if they are still having their purgatory, uh, you want to help them with your prayers. But I think we have to move away from seeing purgatory as a suburb of hell or like a hell with parole. Uh, that was uh, part of the poetry of, of um, uh, Dante when he was writing the Divine Comedy, especially in the Purgatorio. But that was not church teaching. Okay. Maria, please know of our prayers for you and your family as well. It is uh, Open Line Monday here on EWTN Radio. Let's go to Chris now in upstate New York listening on uh, podcasting. Hey, Chris, what's on your mind today, sir? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, Father John, I have a question. Yeah. It, it, it's got like three, three parts that are all interrelated. So um, the general question is... Uh, what what type of icons or um, items should be or are required on an altar or in the sanctuary area for during the celebration of, of uh, mass? And then a specific example might be uh, is a is a cross required with the corpus? And then uh, the third part would be. It, can you suggest a, a church document that I could find these things in? Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I uh, certainly want to make a distinction that in the Eastern Catholic Church, which uh, one branch of it is the Byzantine, but also all the other um, Eastern Catholic uh, rites in, in, in the Eastern uh, Catholic Church, uh, they use icons, those, you know, um, typically made out of wood that are flat and uh in, on the iconostasis, which separates the sanctuary from the rest of the church, they would always have an icon of the Virgin Mary and one of Jesus Christ. Uh, they could also have other icons uh, around the church, on the wall, the ceiling, and so forth, but they typically have those two very prominent uh, icons of Mary and, and, and Jesus, and then uh, some of the angels. Uh, in the Latin church, uh, which um, I belong to, uh, of the Catholic faith, uh, we have uh, three-dimensional um, statues and a crucifix. Uh, and uh, when you read the General Structural Roman Missal, which I just mentioned a few moments ago, it makes it very clear that um, a crucifix is preferred uh, to having a cross with no corpus and that the priest is able to see one. So that if there's not one uh, in his sight, you know, there should be one on the altar, whether it's lying flat or uh, standing up but also one that the faithful can see. So in many churches, there's a big wall crucifix uh -huh. uh, over the tabernacle where the faithful can look, and if the priest isn't celebrating on Orientum, he's facing the people. Uh, I had one on my altar. Uh, we have one at the seminary. Um, it's meant uh, devotional, but it also reminds us that this is the sacrifice of the Mass. Now, that's not to say that you know having a cross with no corpus is, is uh, not permitted, but it's been highly encouraged that we keep the crucifix to remind us that the Mass is the sacrifice. And so, again, you go to that general instruction, it'll tell you precisely what's needed in the Latin Church. And uh, if you, you know, the, the liturgy in St. John Chrysostom or, or St. Um, uh, Basil, uh, they have their own requirements for, for the Byzantine Church. All right. Is that helpful for you, Chris? Yes. I, I, uh, just if, if there's a... Um... A cross with a risen Christ on that would would that be uh, okay? Well, it was permitted. Uh, I think again because particularly under uh, Pope Benedict, uh, he uh, again tweaked uh, the celebration of the Mass uh, to uh, where it originally was intended. And uh, in the church that I was the pastor of for sixteen years, we had uh, a resurrected Christ. It wasn't a res it wasn't a resurrection cross. It was the resurrected Christ. 
And what I said to the people when I got there was, you know, the new missile came out, the third edition, that said the crucifix should be prominent. So I didn't throw it away because somebody donated. I put the resurrected Christ over the doorway so that you saw it on your way out of church. Ah. As you came into church, you saw the crucifix. So I think theologically, that was the best way to do it. Well handled, I'd say. Uh, Chris, thank you so much uh, for your call. It is Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN Radio. Quick email from Monty. Is it correct to say we are not only declared righteous, as in a courtroom, but also made righteous by God's grace? Yes, it's God's grace that uh, uh, th- that we are justified, mm-hmm. uh, particularly, you know, that was won for us on Good Friday, and uh, that's applied to us at our baptism. And it's more than a juridical thing where, you know, the governor can just pardon somebody and, you know, they're still guilty, and uh, the juridical effect is that you get out of prison. Uh, with uh, justification and righteousness, it's more than just a legal thing. It's also a, a, an ontological, metaphysical reality, so that we are made a child of God, we're adopted as part of his family, so that not only is original sin washed away, but we have the infusing of sanctifying grace, the indwelling of the Holy Trinity that makes us righteous in the eyes of God. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you so much for your question, Monty. And one more here. Uh, this is from Jack. How can I explain the Trinity to someone who says it is not biblical and that the verse, <laughs> <laughs> I know, and that the verse in Matthew 28 was added by the Catholic Church? What do you say, Father? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'd like to know what, what evidence they have to say that we yeah. added anything. Uh, if anything, it was the Catholic Church that put the Bible together because uh, prior to Pope Damasus uh, asking, or actually telling St. Jerome to translate the Old Testament from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, and then the New Testament from Greek into Latin, and then he was the first one to put it into a one-volume collection, so to speak. Uh, Those books, those texts, uh, those were recognized uh, by the the early Church. Uh, The Catholic Church did not add anything. In fact, we preserved uh, in a special way in the Old Testament, you know, those uh, 46 books, uh, there were seven that are in the Old Testament uh, that Martin Luther then removed, so that now there's 39 uh, in, in the Protestant Old Testament, but in the Catholic Old Testament, we have all 46 books. Yes. Um, so you don't have anything being added uh, or, or subtracted. Uh, you have things which actually preserved uh, by Holy Mother Church. Very good. It's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio here on EWTN Radio. If you want to call right now, we can probably get your call on today's program. 833-288-EWTN is the number. 833-288-3986. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly with Tracy Sable. Be sure to join Tracy for the Catholic News Perspective on top stories and reports from around the world. On tonight's program, uh, Tracy will be talking about Pope Francis returns to the Vatican from Cyprus, his uh, kind of a lightning trip that he made there. Also, she'll be reporting on the death of Senator Bob Dole, really an amazing man who uh, gave his life for his country so many different ways and and, uh, did so much in in his lifetime. So I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating program. Check it out tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on EWTN radio and television. Back to the phones right now. Let's go to Marie is in Abilene, Texas, listening on uh, St. Looks like a Guadalupe radio there. Marie, what's on your mind today? Hey, Marie in Abilene. Marie in Abilene. Oi, Marie. Uh, I think Marie, maybe, why don't we put her on hold if we would? Now, let's go now to uh, Robert in North Texas. Hey, Robert, what's on your mind today, sir? Uh, thank you for taking my call, and thank you for your program. I'm actually driving uh, through North Texas, and uh-huh. my wife and I just recently moved to a new parish, uh, and I'm in my 70s, and we're just at the eighth parish I've been a member of. And at Mass, uh, when the consecration of the bread and the wine is done, the server rings the bell three times each for each consecration. But then when the priest genuflex rings the bell one more time, and then after the priest receives communion, the server rings the bell one time. And I've never encountered those extra 
single rings of the bell before, and I was just curious about it. Is that optional? Uh, you know, is there a story to that? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, that is, um, I, I don't want to use the word too, too uh, casually, but that's a throwback uh, to the, um, we call the extraordinary form, the traditional Latin mass, the um, Tridentine mass, uh, because in the extraordinary form, uh, it was very specifically stated how many times and at what particular time the bells to be rung. So obviously at the elevation of the host and the chalice after the priest consecrated it, but also when he puts his hands out over the chalice and the paten, what we call the epiclesis. But in the extraordinary form also when the priest would genuflect uh, after he just consecrated and when he received uh, uh, the precious blood. Uh, that is now optional. Uh, most priests in the um, ordinary form do not do it. Uh, they will have the bells rung at the elevation of the of the chalice, the elevation of the host. Uh, but to have it done at those times that you mentioned are certainly optional. Uh-huh. It's not prohibited, but it's not mandatory. Okay. There you go. Uh, Robert, hope that's helpful for you. Thanks for listening to us there in uh, North Texas. Drive carefully, sir. Here's an email that we received from Matt, who says, uh, Father John, thanks so much for your insight on the faith. On a recent Sunday, the gospel quoted Jesus as saying, only the Father knows the time of the final days, not the Son, not angels. How is this to be understood within the church's teaching on the Trinity in that there are three persons, but what one knows, they all know? Thanks again, Matt. Well, we have a real philosopher and theologian here, which I appreciate. Uh, when Jesus was saying that only the Father knows, he's referring to in a very specific and particular uh, area that in his human knowledge, because remember Jesus is true God and true man. He has a full human nature and a divine nature. He's one divine person. Uh, this is part of the um, Chalcedonian formula. One divine person, but two natures, human and divine. And so in his human nature, he's got a human intellect, a human will. His divine nature, he's got a divine intellect and divine will. The divine intellect is shared by all three persons of the Trinity. So what one knows, all three know. But in his human intellect, he only knows those things which, as a human being, would know. Huh. And so that's why when he was born, uh, he didn't start walking on his own. He had to learn how to walk. He had to learn how to talk. He had to learn how to cut his food and, and, and with a knife and fork. <laughs> he had to learn how to spell <laughs> his timetables, everything that you and I as a human being had to learn. Uh, you know, uh, that is something that you know, was not infused into him, but in his divine knowledge, in his divine nature, yes, he would have known because he is God. He's the third person of the Trinity. But in his human knowledge, his human intellect, which is part of his human uh, nature, he would not have known uh, the day nor the hour of the end of the world. Okay, there you go. Matt, thank you so much uh, for your question today here on uh, Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio on EWTN Radio. Let's go to a call now that we received uh, during the overnight hours on the EWTN listener comment line. Ken in Cincinnati. My question is, I'm trying to understand the hypostatic union where Jesus is fully God and fully man. Has that always been the case? Has Jesus always been fully man? Or did Jesus not become fully God and fully man until his incarnation? Thanks. Okay. Yes, that's a good tie into what we just talked about. Uh, In his divinity, in his divine nature, as a divine person, He always existed from all eternity because he was always the son and the father was always the father. So if there was a moment where there was no son, there would have been no father because father was always the father. And that means there was always a son. Um, It's in his humanity, in his human nature, that he has a beginning in the incarnation. Now, Arius, uh, who was condemned as a heretic, believed that Jesus acquired uh, the divinity uh, and that he was sort of subservient to God the Father. Uh, he was sort of like the highest of, of creation. But the Council of Nicaea condemned that. And so in his divinity, he always was divine. He was always God. He was always the third person of the Trinity. It's at the incarnation, when the Word became flesh, that his human nature was created and was united to his divine person. That's what we call the hypostatic union. Hypostasis H- is in, in the Greek, or hypostatic is a reference to how his nature is connected to his person. There's one divine person, uh, and that was Nicaea and also the Council of Chalcedon, 
uh, one divine person, but two natures, human and divine. His divine nature always existed. His human was created in time. But now, because of the incarnation, those two natures are inseparable. I think uh, St. Nicholas had something to say about that, didn't he, Father? Oh, he, he, he belted a, a, a heretic in the face. He sure who, did. Who didn't deny Jesus' divinity. Um, and not that we're advocating that people go around slugging everybody, but right. uh, St. Saint, Saint Nicholas took that very seriously, and which, by the way, that was my confirmation name, Nicholas. So really? I want to take after him. <laughs> okay, very good. I'm actually scrolling through my phone because somebody sent me a... Uh, hilarious song lyric uh, using that uh, using the whole St. Nicholas and Arius story. If I can find that before the end of the show, <laughs> I'm going to share that with everybody. In the meantime, here is a question for you from Joan, who says, Dear Father Tregilio, could you please explain the difference between the Catholic Latin Mass and the SSPX, the Society of St. Pius X? Are their Masses and Sacraments valid? May Catholics receive at their Mass. Thank you for your great ministry, Joan. Yes, they are very valid, the, the SSPX, the Society of Pius X. Uh, certainly the FSSP, which is the Fraternity of St. Peter, are not only valid but listed because they are in full union with the Holy See. Uh, that was, uh, they're the sort of the, the people who broke away from the Pius X and came, returned to uh, uh, the Catholic Church. So the uh, FSSP, the SSPX, uh, even the Pius the Fifth Society, uh, they're all valid masses, but the licit ones are those who are in complete union, full union, uh, with the Bishop of Rome, the Roman Pontiff, and the Pius the Tenth are not in full union, but they are valid, and if a person of the faith is unable to get to uh, the um, their local parish for whatever reason, let's say they're they're visiting a country where there are, are all no um, no parishes available. You can go to the Orthodox Church and count that for your Sunday obligation, and you can also go to the Pius the Tenth. Now I know that the recently the Holy Father, particularly uh, both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, have extended uh, you know people who do go to the Pius the Tenth uh, Mass. Uh, would be fulfilling their Sunday obligation, but they should receive communion only in those parishes that are in full communion uh, with the Church, because that's an important aspect of our Catholic faith, that, you know, ubi patrus ibi ecclesia, where Peter is, there is the Church. Yeah, all right, very good. Thank you so much. Father, you'll be glad to know that I did find that song parody. Uh, <laughs> it was on social media, and here you go, if you can, if you can handle my singing. Here we go. Up at Nicaea, bishops pause, Arius and Santa Claus. One claims a time when the sun was not. One says that's a heretical thought. Ho, 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 who's gonna go? Ho, 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 who's gonna go? Off with a right hook, good Saint Nick. Down goes the dirty heretic. How's that? Could you send me a copy? Because I'm going to give that to the <laughs> seminarian for our I, Christmas show next Friday. I certainly will. We have another call that we received uh, during the overnight lines uh, on the EWTN listener comment line. Roxanne, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I'm calling about my son-in-law who uh, has left the Catholic faith, and he has a lot of questions. He just doesn't believe unless he sees. And he had brought up a question about how in the beginning in Genesis, like there was Adam and Eve, and then how was there Cain and Abel and all the other people came about. And I don't know how to answer that. So I was just wondering if you can answer that for us. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's a good question because I get that a lot when I was teaching CCD to the third graders. They're all like, um, I know they're too young, but they, they show they would be good Perry Mason uh, uh, actors <laughs> because very legally minded. It's true that you see, you know, in Genesis, God created uh, Adam and Eve and then uh, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. So now you're down to three people on earth. Where does uh, Cain get his wife? You know, where does she come from? Uh the purpose of Genesis is not to explain uh, as a history book or as, um, you know, archaeology or anthropology. It's it's a book of faith. And even in Genesis, you've got two stories of creation, which are slightly different. But it's not like you're comparing uh, apples and apples, apples and oranges. Each creation story in Genesis, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, highlight a different uh, religious teaching. 
in, in the first creation story. It's that uh, man is the crowning of creation, so that you know, male and female is created on the last day. Uh, in the second creation story, Adam's created first, then the animals, and he's sort of bored with them, and then he puts them to sleep and takes a rib and fashions Eve, so that now he sees that you know, uh, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Um, we can't read Genesis as a as a science book. It's a book of faith. However, we certainly have religious truths in there, and the truth that there are one human set of parents, which even science now backs up with mitochondrial DNA that there was uh, a first woman, not many, but one, that the whole human race can be traced to one woman and her mitochondrial DNA. Uh, now, how do you get one woman and all the, all the rest of the people, the billions that we've had over the centuries? That's for science to figure out. Uh, what the Bible tells us is that there was one set of parents. Uh, how you get from A to, to B, that's for the scientists to figure out. Uh, Genesis was not written uh, to explain all the details of how these things took place, but to give us a perspective and context. Okay. And we thank you so much for your question. Here's an email from Gordon. Should I let my 16-year-old son, my 16-year-old son, decide for himself when he will make his confirmation? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Um, certainly you don't, want him to, you don't want him to go against his will in the sense that uh, if he definitely doesn't want to be confirmed, uh, then it would be you know, very fruitless for him to go uh -huh. uh, to be confirmed because his act of the will would uh, definitely uh, uh, prevent something from happening. However, if he's living under your roof, you know, you're paying for his food, his education, the roof over his head and everything. Uh, he owes you obedience and respect. So he needs to go to mass on Sunday, even if he doesn't want to go. And if you say, I, I want you to seriously uh, consider getting confirmed, which then means, you know, you're responsible for getting yourself to mass yeah. uh, on, on a regular basis. Uh, so you don't want to force him in the sense that, you know, you twist his arm literally or figuratively. But the same token, you can't be off, uh, you know, laissez-faire or avant-garde about it. Yeah. Uh, just like you wouldn't if, – if you need to go to the dentist, you say you're going. Or if he needs to get a haircut, you tell him he's getting it. Uh, that's part of being a minor. Now, once he turns 18, that's a whole different matter, and especially when he leaves home and is on his own. But while he's living at your house, he's 16, uh, he's still a minor. And you have a moral obligation uh, to insist that say, hey, even if you don't get confirmed, you're going to Mass. You're going with your, the whole family, we're going to go, and we're going to go every Sunday. And if you don't like it, tough. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's and that's, what, that's and that's what happened to us when we were kids. That's the duty of a, a, a parent. Well, I was talking about this with Dr. Ray over the weekend, Dr. Ray Garendi, about uh, you know discipline seems to be uh, falling by the way these days, uh, and and uh, you're not doing your your kids any favors by by giving in on everything, right? No. What if what if he doesn't want to take a shower or a bath? Ouch. You're not going to say, oh yeah, go right ahead. Uh, you're going to let him go out of the house no. stinky. <laughs> Or are you going to let him, let's say you have a daughter, you're not going to let her go out in public wearing uh, suggestive clothing. Of course. You're not going to be a good father. So uh, what applies to our external uh, presentation also applies to internal. Absolutely. Father, could you leave us with your blessing, please? Benedica vos omnipotens Deus, Pater, et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Amen. And uh, my personal note to you, Father John Tregilio, I'm so glad you're feeling better. Thank you very much. God bless you. Don't forget, we do this program Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern, open line, and tomorrow it'll be open line Tuesday uh, with, of course, Father Wade Menezes, so be sure to join us then. I'm, I'm Tom Price. Have yourselves a wonderful afternoon. God bless. He is honored by the Church as a saint with the title of the Seraphic Doctor. Matthew Bunsen and the Doctors of the Church. One of the greatest theologians and Franciscan mystics in church history, Bonaventure also wrote a biography of St. Francis that was commissioned by the Franciscans themselves. It took a saint and 